Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear myself, which is good. Uh, I was actually thinking, uh, probably what I have originally prepared for, I'm going to change it a little bit. And uh, the interesting thing is, when I'm looking at the agenda and the whole series of sessions which are happening here, a lot of it is focused on technology, data, artificial intelligence, media, whole bunch of things. But I thought that the real one who matters is underrepresented, and that's consumers, right? And what we have to really remember is that everything else we are tr doing is to try and reach the consumers, understand them, give them the right kind of offers or engagement opportunities, and shape their behavior in the favor of your brand or your company or your product. And uh, I'm also going to make a couple of very radical statements talking in an advertising week forum and saying that storytelling is dead. I think either I'm too bold and, uh, or too foolish, I don't know. Let's see, we'll figure it out, right? So uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, when we look at consumers, and all the marketers have been studying consumer insights, I think the amount of change that's happening in the world at this point in time requires us as marketers to rethink every single paradigm, every single paradigm without exception, starting with consumer insights. I think consumer insights are totally inadequate and something which we should throw out of the window. It's all about human truths and human insights. Consumers, if you look at it, consumption, okay, those who consume are consumers. The study of consumption or the study of people in the context of consumption is consumer study. And we study the funnels and we do it to death. And particularly those of us who have come from the packaged goods industry, uh, we obsess over those. Probably for the right reasons till now, but the entire landscape has so dramatically changed that consumer insights and study of consumer insights is extremely limited and it's very, very short-sighted. It has to be the study of the human beings in total because what happens outside of consumption in a human's life impacts consumption more than what happens inside that consumption itself. So it's very critical for us to study the entire surround sound around consumption and not just the consumption by itself. So start with that. And then, if you look at it from that perspective and see what's happening in the environment today, even as recently as four years back, some of the things that we were talking about are either no longer valid today, or the things we are talking today didn't even exist four years back, right? Uh, artificial intelligence, now some of the companies, including MasterCard, we started getting it into our uh, marketing mix of how we are doing uh, marketing things like chatbots, things like um, advanced data analytics, uh, and uh, you're talking of virtual reality, you're talking of augmented reality, and you're talking about uh, a combination of virtual reality, augmented reality, and e-commerce all in one single device in one single environment, which is absolutely stunning. You have to embrace all those. Let me start with a simple story, or example rather. Two years back at MasterCard, we started looking at uh, you know, how everyone and their and the brother is experimenting with uh, virtual reality. So how can we be left behind? We also want to be in the game, and everyone wants to do the virtual reality stuff. But what we thought is, rather than doing exactly what everyone else is doing and shoot these 360 degree films, uh, we said, can we take it to the next level? Next level was augmented reality, which is have an extra layer of information that is overlaid on top of your virtual reality. And then we got a little bit more greedy, and we said, can we do uh, commerce in that very environment? And we said, yes, we can do it. And we created, I believe, two years back, our first pilot uh, with the, one of our brand ambassadors, Grime McDowell, uh, helping the consumers or telling the consumers about the iconic 17th hole at the TPC Sawgrass, and trying to tell how to navigate that iconic hole in that iconic course. And it's a 360 immersive uh, experience. But the beauty in terms of augmented reality where it started is when you look at his shirt, his shirt pops out. And it tells you everything about the shirt. Or if you look at his clubs, it comes out and then uh, to the side. Or if it is his, his shoes, 
they pop up to the side and you can learn more about the product while this is frozen. And you look at that, come back to him and he will continue. So it tracks your eye movement and is able to actually uh, see what you're doing and what you're interested in. And finally, if you like something, you like his shoes or you like his gloves or his t-shirt, whatever, uh, you then decide, you go through the purchase process merely by looking at something, focusing at something, and eventually be able to make your purchase within that environment without leaving that environment. So you complete the entire sale in the same environment. So that was fantastic as an experiment. And then we didn't know if it was going to be practical or not, but at least we felt good that this is something which we have tried and we have brought some new technologies together. Now today, it's now become a commercial reality for us where we stuck a partnership uh, with a company called Swarovski, uh, the crystal co company. And Swarovski, today with them we have launched uh, recently, not today, uh, where you are in the work virtual environment and they have got these very expensive chandeliers, for example, which are very few in numbers. So for them to display them at each and every outlet is impossible. And they are very expensive. They are very fragile, very difficult from a logistics point of view. But if you want to really give that experience to the consumer, so you wear this virtual reality, you're transported to that environment, and you can see that chandelier in that particular ambience, how it looks in a room, have a complete view around, look up, down, sides, all. And if you like it, just by staring at the purchase button, which is master pass, you can actually make the purchase from within that environment. So oh, today it's a commercial reality, two years uh, from you know, when we had started the pilot. We are starting a number of these kind of experiments, or likewise we have looked at, for example, uh, we have launched with Mary Claire here in, the U, uh, in uh, New York, in Soho you'll actually find it. It's a, a retail shop of the future. And we have got a mirror, we call it smart mirror and where you stand in front of it, it so knows your body dimensions and how you are looking and you wear a dress, you can choose different colors. And if you like it, right from there you make a purchase. Some of the fascinating things about a technology like this is, even when the shop is closed, when you are doing window shopping, you can make your purchase right from that shop itself, from that window itself, and fulfill. So the key thing here is, when the consumer is at that moment of truth, where they are motivated and inspired to buy your product, are you enabling it in a seamless, effortless fashion? And these have come out of not because the technologies were in existence or we were trying to see how technologies can be applied, but these all started basically from understanding the human truths. Now at that, we said, okay, let's take a, st a step back and look at everything about marketing, every single paradigm we would like to re-examine, and this is probably what we have started looking at. Five very, very significant trends, which has implications to marketers, it has implications to consumers, right? Exploding processing power. And uh, again, I'm sick and tired of it, but I'll still anyway say more amount of computing power today in a smartphone than Apollo 11 had when man landed on moon. Now, that is the power that you're putting in the hands of the consumers, but that power is available to you as a marketer. It's, a, it's, an, it's an awesome power. It makes you really feel powerful. And miniaturization makes it ubiquitous. It makes everything mobile. The devices are mobile. What does it mean? From a marketer's perspective, you can be contextually appropriate like never before. You're catching the consumer at the time that is most relevant at that moment of truth which truly matters is when you are able to serve your message to the consumer. User experience, we have spoiled consumers with brilliant user experience, I guess, that they now don't want to learn anything. Everything should be intuitive. Everything should come to them in an extremely simple fashion where they don't have to exercise their mind. By looking at it, you know exactly what to do, and then you go ahead and use it. Now, that's something which is important, particularly if you are in products or more than products and services, where consumers need to understand things very, very clearly and quickly and instantaneously. That's change in the whole world. Cost reduction. Uh, cost reduction in terms of whatever are the uh, uh, devices that are available. Today, uh, I actually just came back from India uh, last week. I was actually amazed that now there are carriers who are practically giving away smartphones for money which is next to zero. The phone is practically free, well, they should be probably making money out of uh, subscription, right? Data usage, etc. No, the data usage is also free. 
Now, go figure how that model is going to work. It's fascinating, right? And, and that, that particular phone company is uh, taking the world by storm, at least in India, Geo. That's Reliance Geo is what it is called. So practically, they ask you to deposit $30, and after three years, they give you the $30 back, and you have got free usage of phone, data, et cetera. Now, when that kind of a reduction of cost is happening, what does it do to consumers' expectations? Think about it. Right? And if you're a telephone manufacturer or a telephone uh, device manufacturer, or if you're a carrier, and if consumers are now getting used to these kind of things, freebies, we don't know what currency they're going to pay back in. Maybe it is their attention. Maybe it is their watching advertisements. That that's what I mean by attention. Or whatever else it is. We don't know the whole model, but it is absolutely fascinating how the changing cost dynamic is shifting the paradigms pretty significantly. Can it happen with ordinary durables? Can it happen with TVs? Can it happen with other devices that consumers buy? The answer is probably yes. Connectivity is, of course, that's something which is ubiquitous. Going back to my India example, and I see even in rural areas in India, which in the past didn't even have proper roads, even today probably they don't have good roads, but they've got fantastic connectivity. And actually, your devices work there. All the four bars or five bars are actually on in terms of the signal connectivity. It's, it's absolutely amazing, right? In that kind of a scenario, if you see what's happening, the result is a huge digital tsunami. And the digital tsunami also is very fascinating. Why is it important? Is that the fragmentation of attention or things which are vying for uh, customers' attention, like unprecedented kind of a fashion, and equally importantly, uh, the span of attention of consumers getting shorter and shorter. And you would have heard about this multiple times that the average, life's, uh, average attention span of a human being is less than that of a goldfish. And in that kind of a scenario, so you got a goldfish or less than goldfish being bombarded by zillions of channels with content that is absolutely crazy. And on top of it, consumers have got a different set of expectations more number of devices than consumers are there in the world, and what I call as expectation economy. What is this expectation economy? Basically, consumers are extremely well informed today than ever before, or they can be informing themselves in real time exceptionally well. Why does it matter? I go back to my uh, beginning of my career at one point, long back, multiple decades back, uh, when I was with Unilever, we used to do a pricing test where you have tables, and at each table there is a buyer and a seller. So they are just roles played by people. And the sellers were given the product that we were trying to price the price sensitivity around, and the buyers or the designated buyers used to have some chips that they would actually exchange that item with. Every table, we say that you, know, you need to come to a conclusion and agree to a deal, and uh, the price at each table was absolutely different where the uh, uh, transaction took place. So in some cases it was higher, some cases it was lower, etc. But what's fascinating is, once we know at each table what the price point is, then we would go to a table or a uh, wall chart and start writing the actual rates that are being negotiated on each table. So everyone had an opportunity to see, like in a stock market, at what price things are getting negotiated. What do you think that would do to the price? Any idea? When there is transparency of information and you know where the product is being sold at or bought at, there is a downward pressure on price. It'll sink to the bottom and that becomes your lowest common denominator. Now, in this world, what happens now when the social and digital stuff is there, you can see exactly the price. So when you go to your shop, the first thing you see, how much is it on Amazon, how much is it on J&L and Electronics or whatever. So your price has already gone down there itself, right? And as a manufacturer then, your distribution costs are going up, your marketing costs are going up in all likelihood, but your ability to generate higher revenue through higher price is also coming down. And therefore, that brings a higher level of accountability to marketing. I spent roughly half of my career in the business side and the other half in the marketing side. So when I was on the business side, I would give hell to the marketing folks. I said, okay, I'm spending these 100 million, 200 million, whatever is the amount of money on your marketing campaigns. What are you contributing to the bottom line? Now, 
when you reverse the roles, of course, the karma comes to bite you back. And now I'm asked, what the hell are you giving to the bottom line? But the point is when that happens in that covered scenario, there is a higher level of accountability on marketers to deliver results. And to deliver these results and to justify the investments, uh, this is something which I think every CEO and every CMO is practically going through. There's always pressure on marketing budgets. Uh, and uh, the accountability on CMOs to deliver results for the company are very sharply increased in the last few years, like I, never before. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, you know, half of the advertising dollars that I spent, I know go waste. Like Lord Lever Hume had said long, long back, and he said, I don't know which half it is, right? If you say that, now you'll get kicked in the backside by your CFO or CEO. You better know where you're spending money and don't give these smart answers kind of a thing, right? The key thing is you need to know exactly how your money is being spent. And the accountability when it goes up, your need to get results and connect the dots between marketing metrics and the business metrics dramatically shoots up. Likewise, consumers are not satisfied with merely the products that they're buying for their functionality, both emotional benefits and functional benefits. They want above and beyond. They bought a credit card probably for a good credit line, safety and security, convenience, uh, and maybe the looks of the card are good, etc. But then they also want rewards. They want the companies to do good for the society. They want to do, uh, they want a whole bunch from brands and from marketers, which is unbelievable. They, it's not just being only about surprising, uh, only about satisfying the basic needs. Constantly being rewarded. This is one thing which is the, they're demanding. Every single product category, the consumer greed or consumer expectation is growing up pretty dramatically. And there is a sense of entitlement, you know? In the past, we used to say the customer is the king. Now the customer has declared himself or herself as the king. And in that kind of a situation, how you treat them and how you actually engage them, it's a completely different ball game today than it ever was. And lastly, the concept of brand loyalty, I think, is uh, becoming weaker and weaker. Right, if brands disappear, nobody cares. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not there, it's not there, that's fine. And on top of it also, consumers are blocking out marketers. Uh, these are like you know, pests. We, as consumers, if you put ourselves in, our, in the shoes of the consumers, which we are also, we want content that is ad-free and therefore the proliferation of uh, ad blocks. Last year, fourth quarter, there are 200 million people who are active users of ad blocks. In one quarter, it has gone up by 12.5% to 225 million. 225 million good consumers. They are your real prime target. They are telling you, I don't want your ads, and they have blocked your access to them from their devices. And to make the lives of marketers even easier and more interesting, mobile device manufacturers are now putting the ad block software pre-installed. So when you buy your software, when you buy your phone in Asia, it comes with an ad block software pre-installed. All you have to do is just one click and you have put all those pests called marketers out of your way. Now then, if you lose access to 600 million people and these people are smart, savvy people, how would you really navigate through this? And of course, you have got other interesting thing for the sake of the experience, not just the choice and on-demand content, but also equally for having an ad-free experience. Consumers are going to channels like uh, uh, content providers like Netflix, right? 100 million subscribers, billions of hours of video content being watched without the interruption of ads when you look from a consumer perspective. Or from a marketer's perspective, you are talking about prime audience right in front of you, but you can't reach them, right? If we have to sort of wake up and say, if consumers are so allergic to advertisements, if consumers feel that ad ads are an interruption to their experiences that they truly care about, as marketers, are we still trying to say, oh, how do you do this advertisement effectiveness better? How do you reach them? How do you do, et cetera? Because fundamentally, they hate you. They hate you for your ads. And that paradigm has to be changed. As marketers, we have to realize that paradigm is changing, and we have to change our marketing strategies and approaches. And that's why I keep telling storytelling is dead. Storytelling is all about advertising. 
good advertising is good storytelling, and I think that is dead. It's a radical statement being made at an advertising conference, right? But I'm a part of the ecosystem. So I'm just saying this is exactly what we believe. And what we are talking about is you have to engage with consumers in ways which are completely different. It's not through advertisements. It's not through telling stories. You have to connect with consumers in a different way. A, connect with them as people. And when you say connecting with them as people, what does it mean? Understanding what matters in their lives. And we, for example, at MasterCard have done research across 26 countries around the world to see what are the areas of interest where we can connect with consumers. It may have anything to do with my product or not, that's secondary. Because the moment I'm looking at life from my product lens, I'm looking at consumers. I don't want to look at consumers. I want to look at people. I want to look at human beings. And if I want to look at them, understand their lives in totality and see what it is. And we have come up with nine areas which we feel are truly universal for consumers or for people. Nine areas. Example, music. We call each one of these areas as a passion point. So we got music as a passion point, sports as a passion point, culinary experiences, travel, shopping, philanthropy. We got total nine of these passion points, right? And what we are saying is you need to meet the consumers in the environment of that passion. That is what something which they care about in a non-intrusive fashion, in an authentic fashion, easier said than done. And we are exactly trying to do that for the last four years now. And to do this, what we have essentially converted ourselves from a pure advertising kind of an approach to our priceless campaigns. We have now moved a lot into the uh, experiential world and trying to create and curate experiences in the areas of their passions make them a part of the story, make them tell their stories, with their permission amplify those stories, and nobody is going to block their friends if they are bragging about the fantastic experiences that they have in their lives. People are receptive, they, they look at it, so there are no ad blocks against your friends. So we look at that and try to create these experiences at scale, economically, and connected to business results. So the key points, when you have experiential marketing, getting scale is mighty critical, it's mighty difficult on the one hand. Second, doing it economically. Compared to any other media, it's most expensive. So how do you make it economical? And the third one, how do you know it is paying for you? Not just in terms of some awareness scores, net promoter scores, or you're talking of predisposition scores, all those are marketing KPIs which marketing people love. But outside of marketing, nobody cares about these metrics. You need to look at business metrics. Connect your marketing KPIs, which are a leading indicator, to the business results. And you have to justify that your experiences and your experiential marketing or whatever is the approach you have is connecting back to uh, the business results. So, what we have said is, no, basically storytelling is dead, and story making is what we will embrace, and that's what it is all about predominantly. And the other thing is, like I said, experiences matter more than things, and this is a truth which is coming across the world, whether it is a country like India, which is still sort of developing, but developing very rapidly, or it's a very evolved, sophisticated country, maybe like a Germany or France or UK, whichever part of the world it is, it's exactly the same universal truth. Experiences are now mattering more than things. And in that scenario, what we said is the entire marketing paradigm and the strategic framework at MasterCard, we have changed and we said we will all be about what we call internally as marketing 4.0. We have not trademarked this name. And then I realized to my utter appalling appallment a uh, few months back that there has been a book written called Marketing 4.0. And I said, oh God, okay, I wish I had you know, trademarked it. But who cares? Uh, the key thing is we are bringing Marketing 4.0 the way we have defined to life. And that we do through these four powerful experiential platforms. We used to have about 166, 168 themes on mar in marketing around the world, and we killed all those. And we are now just focused on four platforms. Everything that we do has to fall into one of these four platforms. 
Priceless Surprises is all about surprising and delighting your consumers when they're least expecting, and now we are running into millions of priceless surprises being given around the world. Some of them are very expensive and once in a lifetime, but some of them are extremely small in actual uh, economic value, but huge in terms of human gratification and human satisfaction. That's priceless surprises, and we started three years back with Justin Timberlake on a night of Grammy Awards. We are giving away various prizes, and the ultimate prize was where Justin Timberlake will come to your home, spend a day with you, work brilliantly for us, and now we rolled it out, running in 58 countries around the world and doing exceptionally well. And how do we know it's doing exceptionally well? Because we measure. We measure like maniacs, right? On the one hand, we have brand energy, if you look at the brand metrics perspective. This has been seen to be really energizing our brand and differentiating our brand from the rest of the pack on the one hand, right? Uh, and on the other hand, the business results. So on the night when we had uh, launched priceless surprises, there are almost in the United States 47,000 people who are actively inquiring, saying that, where can I get a MasterCard card? Because I want to have that card. Okay, that, that is, uh, you know, for us both on the business side and on the brand side, extraordinary success that night, and that's the beginning, and then we are going nonstop. Priceless Cities is our second platform, and I'll not go, go through all each and every one of them, but I want to touch upon very briefly. Priceless Cities is about creating and curating experiences for the affluent audiences around the world, and these experiences they cannot buy by just throwing money. They can get these experiences that money cannot buy only through a MasterCard. Like for example, if you go to Mexico, and if you go to Cancun, there is a Chichen Itza pyramid complex nearby, and if you want to go there, uh, after the whole complex has closed down, go on top of the observatory, watch the sunset from there against beautiful traditional Mayan music. That's what we create as an experience. And you cannot just get that because the government won't let you climb those structures, but we have secured special permission in limited quantities that people can actually go. And once you have got that experience, you are a convert, hopefully, for lifetime, and you're also a brand ambassador for the brand for lifetime. Simple example, closest to my home, my wife. So we went and we bought this Chichen Itza experience, we went there, and then when we came back, now I can guarantee you, everyone in my neighborhood knows about this experience, they love MasterCard, and they keep asking, where can I get and what else do you have? Now, right now we are in the beta, uh, in most of the countries, we are actually going to introduce about 46 cities so far. The latest being last week, and we call it Priceless Prague, with about 45 extraordinary experiences that money cannot buy. And right now, I believe we are close to about 800 experiences we have put together. And this being tested and the platform, everything will go live probably by first quarter next year on a global basis, fully active and at full force. So this is what we call as priceless uh, cities. I'll just touch upon priceless causes for a minute and then I'll move on. Priceless causes is where we are tapping into another passion point of people, which is all about they've got a philanthropic bent of mind. There is a part of their heart which is philanthropic. They want to do good for somebody else who is less privileged. Uh, and, and it's a very powerful motivator. But unfortunately, greed always trumps philanthropy. And when they choose between I have got miles or cash back or rewards, as opposed to I have an opportunity to feed a poor child. They say I can feed the poor child later, let me get my points because I'm thinking of my next vacation or whatever. So what we said is why should it be an either or, can we combine both and leveraging our massive customer base and we have got 1.7 billion consumers around the world, that's a B, B as in boy. Right, 1.7 billion consumers or customers of MasterCard we have got. And we said, how can we tap into them and their philanthropic, uh, uh, what do you call, tendencies, and do good for the society? This is nothing to do with MasterCard Foundation, which is a different philanthropic organization altogether. The only thing we share common with them is the name. It's a separate company, well-funded. It's probably the largest corporate philanthropy in the world, corporate philanthropy in the world. Uh, run out of Canada. So while they're doing tremendous amount of good, we said, can we bring philanthropy into the core of our business? So partnering, for example, with Stand Up to Cancer, where we run promotions in the US, Canada, and Russia during summer, and for eight weeks, we say, if you spend using your MasterCard at a restaurant, uh, we would contribute a tiny portion of what we make uh, to this Stand Up to Cancer Foundation. 
And we have raised so far more than $40 million. And this $40 million, then they go to fund research, to find cures for cancer. And uh, the beauty is they pick up the best in the world, put them together, they call them dream teams. And these dream teams would uh, come up with drugs. And typically it takes about 12 years for a drug to be discovered from molecule to FDA approval. Now, it's so heartening for us to see that there are already two drugs which have been FDA approved, one for a type of breast cancer, one for a type of prostate cancer in three years. Right, it's an absolutely fantastic thing and also they have come up with a methodology, the scientists called immunotherapy. And immunotherapy is now being, it actually an article appeared in Wall Street Journal as to what a revolutionary methodology it is for, tre for treating cancer or curing cancer. Now, what has a credit card company, we are not a credit card company, we are a technology company, though we are misunderstood to be a credit card company, we don't issue a single card. It's the bank, banks which issue cards on our network. What have we, as that technology company, got to do with cancer? And if you notice, I haven't mentioned about my product anywhere so far. The key thing is get the brand into the hearts of the people in an area that they care about, profits will follow automatically. Right now, priceless causes. We did this likewise with uh, in Europe, in a different uh, philanthropic area, uh, which is feeding poor children. And uh, we have run promotions in 19 countries in Central and Eastern Europe, and have been able to take in 40,000 children in Rwanda, with the money that we have raised that way to feed them for one full school year. Now you're feeding these small, poor, hungry children, which is fantastic in itself. But what is also equally gratifying is that the school attendance in these schools has gone up by 11% in total, and amongst girl children, it has gone up by 14%. That sets a different economic impact and a different social impact, which is very, very powerful. This is what we call as priceless causes, right? And what does it do to the business? Yeah, it makes people feel good, two things. Number one, the brand becomes more and more likable. So we are one of the top brands now, uh, including in the US, on a scale of likability, one of the most likable brands. Actually, we're at number four. And on the other hand, we also have got fantastic business results. It clearly shows consumers say, I would as usual use my MasterCard because I'm making a difference. Yet, I'm getting my points also, but I'm making a difference to somebody else, and that is very gratifying. So for them, consumer, you've got a happy consumer who likes your brand and gives you more business, and it has nothing to do with my product category, if you were to say. That's what I mean to say, don't look at consumers as consumers, but if you look at from an overall broad human life and human angle, your strategies could come into a very, very, very different place. Things fail. Hats vanish. Cars give up. Glass shatters. Shoes surrender. But experiences last forever. That's why MasterCard collected unforgettable experiences around the world. Just for cardholders. Book them, treasure them. Because they're priceless. This is something which we have produced in, thank you. Thank you. This is something which you produced in Brazil and uh, when we are launching priceless cities in Brazil, and we have got a similar thing now we are launching in every country, as I said. Not every country, but 45 different cities so far. Uh, and uh, I talked about priceless surprises and priceless causes. Uh, but overall, what we are seeing is our approach is connecting people to priceless possibilities. That's what underlines us as a network, which is what we are, that is technology enabled. We connect, we are all about connections and we connect people, whether they are rich, poor, small, young, big, we don't care, they're people. And priceless, which is the essence and soul of our brand and possibilities is what we bring. It is something which they are, uh, you know, which they are better off as human beings when they experience this. And as I said, with the change in the environment, as people are evolving, 
as technology is evolving, we as brands and we as companies have to evolve. And that's why we have started also simultaneously investing very heavily uh, our efforts and our dollars behind new technologies in a big way. But clearly realizing that we are looking at these technologies as enablers. We are looking at data as an enablement or as an enabler. We are looking at every single one of them as enablers. It is the end human being that really matters. And that's exactly how we are looking at this whole thing. So thank you very much. And we got about five minutes. We have five minutes if you want to have any questions. If you don't have any questions, I'll go and have my coffee. Anyone bold enough, brave enough? Yes, please. Uh, can someone give him a mic? Yes, sir. All right, Joe's Duncan here from Cara. Hello. Hello. What, what impact do you think this might have on the creative process? What impact does it have on the creative process? Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's one of the most interesting challenges we have. Firstly, from the uh, who you have as your agency partner that understands your brand and that understands your business is mighty critical and who understand the culture of your company because each company has a level of risk tolerance, right? And how much can they push the edge and go beyond the boundaries? That's very, very critical for them to understand. That's one part of it. It's a significant change, uh, impact there. Secondly, do you want to be fragmented? Do you want to be consolidated? So from the creative process, we have chosen to consolidate and put all our eggs in one basket, which is McCann. Right, and they have been doing an amazing job, so we are sticking with them. Number three, uh, it has got from a creation point of view, uh, we are actively engaging people in the company outside of marketing as well. And source ideas from them, thoughts from them, thought starters from them, uh, so that there is a collective ownership about these platforms. It's not just a marketing platform, but it is a MasterCard platform. That's another thing very important. The other point is we have started something what we call as the priceless engine, which is a real-time digital marketing engine that is hyper-targeting consumers in real time uh, and contextually very appropriate, where we are able to launch campaigns from concept where we understand social signals and identify trends to the point where the campaign is in the market end-to-end -end less than 12 hours. Now, that requires putting entire creative process on its head, which we have done. So it's nothing short of transformational for us in terms of how the creative process has been. And uh, that's the journey we have been doing it, very thoughtfully, very steadily. We didn't want to upset the Apple card because the company was doing so well, is doing so well, thankfully. And uh, the marketing has been terrific. Uh, but then we said, we cannot sit on our past laurels and you know keep uh, living off of the old priceless campaign, which was still working, but we wanted to evolve that and take it to the next level, taking advantage of all the changes in the ecosystem, including technology, including data, including all the good stuff that's happening, and bring them to life. And we are glad that we have done it because, as I said, the brand is moving very well, the business is doing very well. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. I think we are just on time. Thank you.